Good morning, and welcome to St. Paul's as we gather online to give thanks for the most precious body and blood of Christ on this feast of Corpus Christi. Let us pray. Lord, feed your children with the true manna, the living bread from heaven. Let this holy food support us through our earthly pilgrimage until we come to the place where there is neither hunger nor thirst. We pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen. It's appropriate on this feast of Corpus Christi that we share together in an instructed Eucharist. Throughout the service, there will be a running commentary to help us explore together the purpose of our gathering and the how and the why of what we do when we get together. The service we are sharing is known as communion, for in it we commune with God and also with each other as the body of Christ. It is also known as the Eucharist, which is the Greek word meaning thanksgiving. In the Eucharist, we give thanks for what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. The Eucharist is like a drama that we all enter. The first act of the drama is the liturgy of the word. God's mighty acts in history are recalled through scripture and applied to our lives in the sermon or homily. The second act of the drama is the liturgy of the table. The liturgy isn't something that the clergy do while the congregation watches. This can be seen in the word liturgy itself. Liturgy is a Greek word that comes from the root words for people and work. So the liturgy is quite literally the work of the people. The liturgy is something that we all do together. The moving of our hearts to offer praise and song to God is part of our very core as human beings. At present, every service at St. Paul's has three hymns, plus music played during the offertory. When we're all able to gather back together, physically again, this number will expand to approximately 10. Our opening hymn is Jesus Feeds Us.
taken from 2 Corinthians 13, 13. Many people cross themselves at the beginning of the opening acclamation. The sign of the cross dates back to at least the year 200 AD when Christians marked themselves with the cross on the forehead. By the next century, the gesture had become the bigger one we use today. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. The greeting is followed by the prayer known as the Collect for Purity. This Collect was an English rendering by Archbishop Thomas Cramner of the Latin prayer that started the Sarum Rite liturgy used by medieval churches in England before the Reformation. For centuries, the Collect for Purity was said silently by the priest. The prayer book of 1552 made this prayer a public one, said aloud by the priest for all the people gathered. At St. Paul's, it is said by the whole congregation. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you, and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. The service continues now in every season of the year but Advent and Lent with a song of praise. Often this is the glory to God, or Gloria, a Greek Christian hymn modeled on the Psalms of unknown authorship and age. By the fourth century, it formed part of the morning prayers and attained its present place in the Holy Eucharist by the middle, early Middle Ages. This song centers the service on the God we're gathered to praise in our worship. Out of respect, some people slightly bow their head whenever the name of Jesus, Jesus is mentioned. This echoes the words of St. Paul in his letter to the church in Philippi. Many people also cross themselves at the mention of the Trinity at the end of the glory. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High. Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Collect, which follows the Gloria, is written to go along with both the season of the church year and the readings for the day. It helps collect us together by summarizing the attributes of God as revealed in the scripture for the day. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you that in this wonderful sacrament you have given us the memorial of your passion. Grant us so to reverence the sacred mysteries of your body and blood that we may know within ourselves and show forth in our lives the fruits of our your redemption. For you are alive and reign with the Father in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
reading and commenting on scripture goes back to the earliest services of Christianity. Following the pattern of Jewish synagogue worship, readings follow a set pattern for what will be read when. This is known as a lectionary. The Christian communities began to add letters of Paul and others to their service. It was these readings that became, in time, our New Testament. In non-COVID times, our usual pattern at our Sunday services is to read a portion of a book in the Old Testament, a psalm, a portion of a New Testament epistle or letter, and a portion of a gospel. Since March of last year, we've reduced our readings to a psalm, a first reading, and gospel. In the Anglican Church of Canada, we follow the Revised Common Lectionary, which is used by 45 church bodies worldwide. The translation of the Bible we use at St. Paul's is the 1989 New Revised Standard Version. The NRSV has received the widest official authorization by the churches of any translation of the Bible with endorsement for public use by the Anglican Communion, 30 Protestant churches, and the American and Canadian conferences of Catholic bishops. At uh, churches, uh, sorry, at uh, our triple C services, as part of their creative aspect, we use different translations of the Bible. And uh, we've just started to use the revised English Bible for the Old Testament and N.T. Wright's Kingdom Translation for the New to help us hear Holy Scripture afresh. We begin our readings with a portion of a psalm. Since 1,000 years before Christianity, the psalms have been included as part of the corporate worship of God's people. Because of their breadth and depth of expression about our core, about our relationship with God, they are rightly called the church's songbook and prayer book. I invite you to say in this psalm the parts that are in the bold italics. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his servants. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant and the child of your handmaid. You have freed me from my bonds. I will offer you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call upon the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of you, O Jerusalem. Hallelujah. Let's say the prayer after the psalm together. Eternal God, faithful in your tender compassion, you give us hope for our life here and hereafter through the victory of your only Son. When we share his cup of salvation, Revive in us the joy of this everlasting gift. We ask in his name. Amen. Our first reading from Holy Scripture today is being shared uh, on video by Dory. A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. But when Christ came as a high priest of the good things that have come, then... Through the greater and perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy place, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls, with the sprinkling of the ashes of a heifer, sanctifies those who have been defiled, so that their flesh is purified, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, 
Purify our consciences from dead works to worship the living God. For this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, because a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions under the first covenant. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. The reading of the Gospel is the last of the scripture readings and the climax of the series. Several actions are taken to show the particular importance we place on Jesus' words and actions. The Gospel book is carried in procession to the place of reading. The Gospel traditionally was read from a pulpit or ambo, hence the term gradual for the hymn before the Gospel from the Latin gradus, meaning step. It's now often read in the middle of the congregation, a fitting way to hear the story of the Word who became flesh and dwelt among us. Other actions and posture also mark out the importance of the Gospel. The congregation stands for the reading of the Gospel. Before and after the Gospel reading, the people acclaim Christ present in the sacred Word. Some also make the sign of the cross with their thumb on their forehead, lips, and breast. And they do that to express their prayer that the good news be in their mind, on their lips, and in their hearts. So I invite us to sing our gradual hymn, This Is My Body. of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. On the first day of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb is sacrificed, Jesus' disciples said to him, Where do you want us to go and make the preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him, and wherever he enters, say to the owner of the house, The teacher asks, Where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. So the disciples set out and went to the city and found everything as he had told them. 
and they prepared the Passover meal. While they were eating, he took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, gave it to them, and said, Take, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, and all of them drank from it. He said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I tell you, I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. When they had sung the hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Having someone comment on the scriptures read goes back to the earliest days of Christianity and to the Jewish synagogue worship which preceded it. Preaching was rare during the Middle Ages, but was put back into a place of honor in the Reformation of the church in the 1500s. Since 1549, a sermon has been required at every Eucharistic service. The purpose of a sermon is to connect two worlds, the world of the texts of Holy Scripture and the 21st century world in which we live, so that we may hear and put into practice what God is speaking to us today. Today's sermon is really the whole running commentary on our liturgy, uh, but I just want to comment very briefly on how our first reading and gospel remind us that we know eternal life by receiving Jesus' life within us. Jesus literally laid down his life out of love for you and me. Take, this is my body, he says to the disciples. He offers himself to us. He wants us to receive his life within so that we may be alive indeed alive to worship the living God, as Jesus says. And he speaks of us receiving our eternal inheritance, of us having eternal redemption. All of those are, are things that are said in, in our passage from Hebrews. And in chapters 12 and 13 of the same epistle, Jesus' life within us is meant to enable us, it says, to be bread that feeds the world. Pursue peace with everyone. Let mutual love continue, the writer says. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. Remember those who are in prison as though you were in prison with them. Those who are being tortured as though you yourselves were being tortured. Finally, do not neglect to do good and to share what you have. We have one who gives his body for us so that we may be his body in the world. May we receive his life within us so that we may share the bread of life in a world so hungry for it. In his most precious name we pray. Amen. Probably one of the shortest sermons you will ever hear me preach. <laughs> well, in response to the read and explained word of God, we now affirm our faith together. At St. Paul's, we usually do this by saying the apostles are the Nicene Creed. The word creed comes from the Latin credo, for I believe. Both creeds have a Trinitarian framework and present the second part, the person and mission of the Son, in a more extended form than the first and third. The Apostles' Creed goes back in a simpler form to the first half of the second century in Rome. 
Its primary use was in connection with baptism. In the ninth century, it was added to the hour services. From these, it passed into morning and evening prayer and the 1549 Book of Common Prayer. The Nicene Creed is an expression, or expansion rather, of the creed issued in 325 by the Council of Nicaea, which had its own roots in the baptismal creed of Jerusalem. Its use in Eucharistic worship appears to have begun in Antioch in the fifth century and gradually spread through East and West until it was incorporated into the Roman Eucharistic liturgy in 1014. The word Catholic means universal. Anglicans have always professed to be part of the Catholic or universal church. Many people cross themselves at the mention of the resurrection and eternal life at the end of the creed. And so now let us confess our faith as we say, we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world to come. Amen. Now we pray for ourselves and particularly on behalf of others. The prayers of the people are a response to the word proclaimed, growing out of the context of the community and the content of the proclamation as they prepare the people for the active response of the Christian life. The BAS offers many different forms for these prayers but all usually lift up our thanksgivings and petitions for the church, the queen and all in authority, the world, the local community, those in need, and the departed. At St. Paul's, we also often use other prayers reflecting the theme of the day or the current situation in the world, as is the case in today's service. Fittingly, as they are of the people, these prayers are led by members of the congregation. At present, one of the six members of the Prayers of the People Ministry. Today, the member of this ministry who's leading these prayers in person is Murray.
Today we're going to do the Corpus Christi Litany. We pray to the Lord. Lord, listen to the prayers of your people gather, gathered at your table. In faith we pray. We pray to you, our God. Here, where we celebrate how Christ gave us his body to be our spiritual food, Listen as we pray for his body, the church, spread throughout the world. In faith we pray, we pray to you, our God. Here, where we recognize the presence of Christ, who takes away the sin of the world, listen as we pray for the, that world and for its peoples for whom his blood was shed. In faith we pray, we pray to you, our God. Here, where we come together as Christ gathered with his friends to give us this meal of holy fellowship, listen as we pray for all whom you have given us, our friends, and all those whose lives are joined with ours. In faith we pray, we pray to you, our God. Here, where we remember the night of Christ's agony and trial, listen as we pray for all who share his sufferings through fear or pain or distress of many kinds. In faith we pray, we pray to you, our God. Here, where we join our praises with the whole company of heaven, listen as we pray for all who have trusted Christ's promise to raise up on the last day those who eat his flesh and drink his blood. In faith we pray. We pray to you, our God. Lord, satisfy our hunger with the food that lasts the bread of God, which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Join with me in this prayer in response to COVID-19. God of all people and all nations, hear us as we pray. We hear the news that 3.7 million people have died from this terrible pandemic, and we confess to becoming numb to the sorrow and pain. Help us to remember that these are not mere statistics on a chart or a graph. Remind us that each one was a human being with a family and friends. Each is one of your beloved children. Do not allow us to move too quickly from our grief and become reckless in our desire to return to normal. Give wisdom to our political and religious leaders. Give strength to our public health officials. Provide comfort and rest for our first responders. Nurses, doctors, and caregivers. Give us patience and perseverance for the days and months ahead so that we could continue on the path to healing and help us to unite in the common goal of defeating this awful virus. This we pray in Christ's holy name. Amen. And here we'll raise up a response to residential schools abuse. A voice was heard in Rama, wailing and loud lamentation. Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be consoled because they are no more. Let us open our ears to the voice and lamentations in Kamloops and hundreds of communities across this country 
the voice of mothers, fathers, grandmothers, and grandfathers, generation after generation, wailing for their children who were taken from them. Let us open our ears to the sobs of those children torn from the families and protection of their families, estranged from their culture and their sense of their own identity, left with the pain that they often carried in their whole lives. Let us hold in our hearts those who were abused, and let us remember those who never came home, whose lives were stolen from them by disease and neglect, particularly the 215 children whose graves have now been discovered. As we have so shamefully failed them in this life, may they find honor and healing as the first in your kingdom. We pray for our nation at this reminder of stories still untold, pain still unshared, responsibility still not taken. Teach us the lessons of your cross, that it is only in opening ourselves to pain of others in sharing their burdens and love that we may find healing together. We conclude with the collect for the holy innocents. Almighty God, our heavenly Father, whose children suffered at the hands of Herod, receive, we pray, all innocent victims in the arms of your mercy. By your great might, frustrate all evil designs and establish your reign of justice, love, and peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The prayers of the people are followed by the confession of sin. We ask God's forgiveness for things done and left undone, and for the strength to live as we were created to do. The sacrament of reconciliation, private confession, is also offered at St. Paul's. The Anglican view of private confession is that all may none must and some should. Private confession to a priest can be particularly helpful for those who desire to unburden themselves of past wrongs and to set out on new trajectories in their lives. Dear friends in Christ, God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy, welcoming sinners and inviting us to this table. Let us confess our sins, confident in God's forgiveness. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. The priest, in giving absolution, assures us that all who make sincere confession are forgiven by God. Traditionally, people kneel, or if standing, they bow during the words of the confession and the absolution. This declaration is called an absolution, and it is one of the ways that ordained priests and bishops fulfill the commission that Jesus gave to his disciples. Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven then. If you retain the sins of any, 
they are retained. Often people cross themselves as the priest shares the words of absolution. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. When we receive God's forgiveness, we're set free to share God's precious gift of peace with one another. The peace is not an intermission. It is an act that gives expression to the truths that, the world, that we are all part of God's family and that God calls us to love one another. In its location in our liturgy, the peace gives us the opportunity to put into practice our Lord's words in Matthew 5, 23, 24. When you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother or sister, and then come and offer your gift. In the early centuries, Christians would greet each other with the kiss of peace. At St. Paul's in the past, we've shaken hands or exchanged hugs. At present, with those not in our cohorts, we've been bowing or offering other non-contact gestures of peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Wherever we may be, let us greet one another with the peace of Christ. Now we come to the second act in the drama with the liturgy of the table. The second act begins with the offertory. Here we pause to offer to the Lord our time, talents, and treasure, remembering that the gifts we've been given are gifts to be shared. In our parish family, one may share our treasure. One way we may share our treasure is through the offerings we give to thank Paul's. Thank you, everyone, for continuing to give financially to St. Paul's so that as a parish we can carry out our mission of sharing the bread of life throughout the world. We give thanks for the gifts of bread and wine which represent the bounty of God's creation and our own work in the world. It's also customary for those officiating to ceremonially wash their hands, an act called the lavabo, from the Latin translation of Psalm 26, verse 6. This symbolizes a prayer for purity as they prepare to preside at this holy sacrament. Occasionally at St. Paul's, we offer incense in our worship on special days such as Christmas Day or Epiphany or at the great vigil of Easter. The tradition of using incense in the liturgy dates back to the ancient Hebrews as recorded in Psalm 141. Let my prayer be set forth in thy sight as incense. As this verse suggests, incense symbolizes the prayers of the faithful rising up to heaven. Incense in the Bible also appears in association with visions of the divine, most notably in the book of Isaiah and in the revela revela revelation of St. John the divine. The smoke itself is associated with purification and sanctification. Thus, we sense the altar and the elements of the Eucharist to show that they are set apart and when we sense the people, we are not only purifying them, but acknowledging that they are set apart already by their baptism. Worshiping with incense is another way in which our worship engages all our senses. Our seeing, our hearing, our taste, our touch, and our smell.
as the altar is prepared, we'll now listen to our virtual choir sing the offertory anthem, Blessed Are You, Lord, while our screen shows a slide that mentions the ways we can participate in our mission by sharing our support. Let us pray together the prayer over the gifts. God, our sustainer, receive the gifts we bring before you and feed us continually with that bread which satisfies all hunger. Your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our offering is the first of four actions in the Eucharist. Just as scripture tells us that Jesus took less broke and gave the bread and wine. So this first part of our four actions is for the priest to take the bread and wine. When we gather together, we remember the most wonderful gift of all, Jesus, our Lord. Through repeating the words and actions of Jesus' last meal with his disciples, we ourselves join the story and make it our own. We don't just watch the drama or listen to it unfold, but we enter into the story as we too take the bread and wine and eat and drink. The elements of communion become the outward signs of inward grace. That grace or gift from God is Jesus' real presence in the Eucharist through the power of the Holy Spirit. The bread and wine become for us spiritual food and drink. The first part of the Eucharistic prayer is called the Sersum Corda, from the Latin words for lift up your hearts. It is an ancient part of the liturgy, and these words have been used in the Eucharistic liturgy since the very early centuries of the church. It is a remnant of an early Jewish call to worship. The proper preface often mentions the themes of the day or the church season. The Sanctus so-called because of the Latin word for holy, is also an ancient part of the liturgy since the earliest centuries. The first part comes from Isaiah's vision of heaven. In Isaiah chapter 6, verse 3, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. 
The second part comes from the Gospel's description of Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest heaven. Many people cross themselves at the second part of the Sanctus. The words, this is my body and this is my blood, are called the words of institution. The great prayer invoking the Holy Spirit to consecrate the gifts is called the Epiclesis. The great Amen is the people's ratification of the Eucharistic prayer. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Blessed are you, gracious God, creator of heaven and earth. You are the source of light and life for all your creation. You made us in your own image and call us to new life in Jesus Christ, our Savior. We give you thanks because having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And on the night before he suffered, sitting at table with his disciples, he instituted these holy mysteries that we, redeemed by his death and restored to life by his resurrection, might be partakers of his divine nature. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We give thanks to you, Lord our God, for the goodness and love you have made known to us in creation, in calling Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all, in the word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, a death he freely accepted, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, Father, according to his command, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory, and we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we made acceptable in him may be sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, reconcile all things in Christ and make them new and bring us to that city of light where you dwell with all your sons and daughters, through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation, by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory are yours, almighty Father, now and forever. The, Lord prayer, the Lord's Prayer follows in contemporary language. 
It's called the Lord's Prayer because Jesus gave it to us as a guide for our prayers. As our Savior taught us, let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. In the ancient tradition of the church, the presiding clergy person waits to break the bread until after the Lord's Prayer. The breaking of the bread is a reminder of the sacrifice of Christ's body and blood on the cross. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. We many are one body, for we all share in the one prayer. The invitation used today is a modern rendition of the ancient church's invitation to communion, holy things for the holy, which was used in the Eastern Church from at least the fourth century. the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The body of Christ keep you in eternal life. The blood of Christ keep you in eternal life. It is common for Anglicans to cross themselves before receiving each element, and then again before leaving the altar. In non-COVID times, communion is taken by first receiving the bread by placing your right hand over your left and extending it to the priest. Next, you are invited to place your hand on the bottom of the chalice to help guide the chalice to your lips. If you prefer, you may receive only the bread or only the wine. We believe that Christ is fully present in either element. The words of promise about the cup are shared with everyone as a reminder that they are spoken to us all. Those not wishing to receive communion are welcome to come forward for a blessing. If you come forward for a blessing or prefer not to receive either the bread or the wine, please cross your arms over your chest in an X to signify your intention. At present, consecrated hosts, each infused with drops of wine, can be picked up on Saturdays between 2 and 2.45 p.m. Or by, or by appointment from a table just inside the main entrance of the church. They're in individual paper cups and covered in a sealed baggie to make them safe for everyone. We recommend that you hold on to the, to the host and partake physically during communion time at this moment of the service. The practice of spiritual communion goes back to the Middle Ages. It's been used especially by Christians in times of persecution, such as the era of state atheism in the Eastern Bloc and times of plagues, such as the current COVID-19 pandemic, when many were unable to partake of communion physically. It affirms that all of us, whether or not we're partaking physically of the bread and wine today, have the opportunity to feed on our Lord and our hearts by faith with thanksgiving. And so I invite us all to say the prayer for communion on our screens together. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. 
I embrace you as if you were already there and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. We partake in the Eucharist and are spiritually nourished, but it's not for our benefit alone. Communion enables us to return to the world with renewed vigor for proclaiming the gospel in our words and in our lives. After communion, we rise and give thanks that we have been fed and nourished by Christ's body and blood to sustain us, to live in the world as the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. A portion of the sacrament is reserved and placed in the ombre or tabernacle behind the altar. Let us pray together the prayer after communion. All praise to you, our God and Father, for you have fed us with the bread of heaven and quenched our thirst from the true vine. Hear our prayer that being grafted into Christ, we may grow together in unity and feast with him in his kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Glory to God whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation, in the church and in Christ Jesus, forever and ever. Amen. Following the doxology, the priest pronounces God's blessing upon the people. This traditional blessing is based on the words that Paul wrote to the church in Philippi. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. It is customary to respond to the blessing by making the sign of the cross as a symbolic reception, as a symbolic expression of reception of the blessing and willingness to carry the cross as Jesus' disciple. Christ, who has nourished us with himself, the living bread, make you one in praise and love, and raise you up to the last day. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. We always end our services the way we began, by singing God's praise. Our closing hymn, One Bread, One Body.
the announcements uh, go back to the 1950s when someone said, oh, you know, the service just wasn't long enough. Uh, no, actually, <laughs> they probably uh, go back all the way to the beginning of Christian worship. Uh, certainly the last chapters of some of Paul's epistles, uh, which were meant to be read to the entire congregation, uh, sounded an awful lot like announcements. <laughs> they are an important part of our time together, helping us stay connected and grow in our common life as members of the body of Christ at St. Paul's. I have two announcements today. The first is the wonderful good news announcement for our whole parish family uh, that I uh, said in uh, yesterday's uh, email that I would tell everybody about today. Uh, I'm delighted to read the following letter from Archbishop Greg to our parish. Dear people of St. Paul's, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. I am writing to share the joyous news that Deacon Betty Naderek will be appointed to serve as deacon in the parish of St. Paul's Anglican Church in Calgary. I appreciate your generosity in accepting Betty into your church family and I know you will appreciate the prayerful, gentle, and loving approach Betty has to her faith and all those around her. May the ministry of St. Paul's be strengthened and renewed through Betty's sharing in ministry leadership with you all. Peace and blessings be with you all. And it's signed by the Archbishop. So, um, Betty, I want to uh, congratulate you on your ordination to the diaconate and uh, to uh, say that we are delighted to uh, be able to welcome you to St. Paul's and uh, with hearts grateful to God, we look forward to sharing the journey of discipleship with you as uh, a member of our parish family. And if we were... Uh, uh, here in uh, with the people uh, in the congregation, we would all be uh, applauding at this point. Uh, so welcome to our parish family. So that was the first announcement. The second is the invitation to join our post-service virtual coffee time via Zoom today. Uh, it's at uh, 11:30 uh, in the morning and. Uh, the slide on our screen shares how to get the link that you'll need to do that. Uh, it would be wonderful to share this time of fellowship with you today. And as the celebration ends, we are charged to go. The Eucharist is therefore not an exclusive gathering that separates us from the world, but a challenge to reach out beyond our own church to the world around us. Having been strengthened through the Eucharist, we are sent forth to carry Jesus' love with us into our homes, schools, and places of work. The Eucharist is over. Now the service begins. Go forth into the world, rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Thanks be to God.